Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Bible Church. Uh, we're glad you're here today. Just a couple announcements before we get started. Um, Muskegon Pregnancy Center, we have a bottle up on the back table there if you'd like to give a little bit of a donation, some change out of your car. Uh, during this pandemic time, uh, giving's been slow and they're looking for a little extra, so we have a jar up there for some of that offering. Uh, secondly, if you can't hear well this morning, feel free to come closer. These chairs are never used up front and uh, Pastor Lee promises he won't bite when he's preaching. So feel free to come closer if you can't hear well today. Also, Butch McKelly was telling me that uh, he wanted to say thank you to everybody for all the cards and all the love that people poured out upon him while well, he was down. With that, Dale, please come. Good morning. Good to see you all this morning. Would you stand with me, please? We're going to start by singing uh, hymn number 267, Come Thou Almighty King. We're going to sing all four stations. Well, good morning, everyone. At this time, I'm going to ask uh, several individuals who have graduated either from high school or college in the past 12 months to join me. So, uh, Kayla, if you would join me here first to my right. Veronica, if you'd come and stand next to her. And Keaton, if you would join us as well. Are there any other graduates in the past year I don't know about? Because if you have, I'd like you to join us as well. Anyone? Any takers? Somebody's pointing. Lisa, we, we check with Lisa, but Lisa said she had already, she's not in the past year, so. All right. Well, I've invited them up here because every culture has its milestones where you pause to take reflection on accomplishments and think about the future. And for our culture, graduation is certainly one of those times. And it serves both functions serves the function of looking back at the accomplishment of earning a degree, of reaching this milestone, and so we want to thank God for that. It also allows us to look to the future and declare our intentions for the future. In the same way that the Bible and, and Moses offered the nation of Israel in the Bible the choice between blessing and curses, between obedience and disobedience, he asked Israel to declare their intentions. And of course, it's Joshua who very famously answered in a very personal way. He said, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. 
And so it's really good to come together with these three graduates and to uh, have a, we're going to have a presentation to our high school graduate, Kayla, in a moment from Pastor Ed as he'll present a Bible to her on behalf of the entire church. But we certainly want to pray over them. That's really, really quite important. And so Kayla has earned her high school degree. Veronica has earned her CAD degree, associate's degree in CAD, right? Computer-aided drafting. Do I get that right? And when I asked uh, Keaton, he indicated that his bachelor's degree is in occupational safety. And he was quick to add a 4.0. And, oh, she's a 4.0 as well. Well, that, that's not a requirement to be up here, by the way, because if it was... <laughs> If it was, someone else would be making the presentation. <laughs> but, and we won't go there any further. But in any event, um, yeah. <laughs> well, John, you have a question about 4.0? That's supposed to be 4.0. 4. 4. Oh, got it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Forgive my vernacular there. <laughs> but uh, no, we're very proud of all three of them. And so... Uh, I'd like to ask Pastor Ed, if he would, to present uh, to Kayla a Bible on behalf of the church. Go ahead and let her have that. And congratulations! And no, no handshake. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The coronavirus fist pump. I want to read before we pray over them. I want to read from the book of Jeremiah these words, because I do think this is a time for all three of you to think about the future and to think about your intentions of the future, even at this crossroads in your lives. And so Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 7 and 8 say this. I'll read this before we pray. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, and whose trust is the Lord. For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes but its leaves will be green and it will not be anxious in a year of drought nor cease to yield fruit. Let's pray for these three graduates and ask God's blessing upon them. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much uh, for our three graduates here that we are honoring. We thank you for their perseverance for the blessing of the energy and the intellect to complete their degrees successfully. And now, Lord, as they head forward, we ask that you will continue to empower them with your Holy Spirit, that you will keep them from temptation, that you will use their lives in a way to bring glory to your name, to advance your kingdom, and to live a life that is pleasing in your sight. Lord, help us to be faithful to pray for them often. We look to the future with great anticipation to see how you will use this accomplishment to bless them, to bless us, and to bless your name. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you for coming up. Since it's coronavirus time, I'm not going to hug you, but thank you. And as we prepare to continue our song service, listen to these words from the book of Philippians, chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Would you stand, please? We're going to sing Like a River Glorious, all three stanzas, please. Like a river glorious is God
I'd like to read from uh, Revelation chapter 5 before we have our congregational prayer today. Verses 11 through 13. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we too want to stand with this chorus and sing praise unto your name. For we too know that you are worthy of all honor and praise. You are the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. The plan of salvation for us has been made to save this dark and dying world. And you have given of yourself and were crucified for this purpose. You also were raised from the dead and promised resurrection to all who place their faith in you. I pray, Lord, that all who are here this morning will take some time to examine themselves to make sure that they are in the faith. Then we can freely worship together with great joy. However, there are those times, O Lord, that we take our eyes off from our great Savior and we have allowed other agendas to be magnified in our lives. So now we want to repent and turn back to pursuing a godly life and seeking to serve the living Savior. We ask for forgiveness for our prideful approach to life and we also desire for that close relationship to be restored to you once again. I also want to pray for the needs of our congregation. I can think of uh, several who are in the midst of struggles right now. I think of Pat Williams and Betty Bush and Jean Burns and Janet Powers as they all deal with physical issues. I also want to pray for the many others in our congregation who have issues of all sorts which have not been mentioned this morning. That's why, Lord, we can come and we do come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Only you, O Lord, can take care of our people. Only your love is steadfast and eternal. We know that you love us uh, in this life to the uttermost. And we know that your love will continue uh, even when it's our time to go and to live forever in eternity. We want to thank you and praise you for your loving care. I also want to pray for our missionaries this morning. It seems so easy to forget these diligent workers for Christ. I pray, Lord, that you'll help them to find the right means, the right avenues, to continue to testify of your name, even during this time where so many communities have large-scale shutdowns. Only you can produce the venues and uh, bring uh, hearts that are desirous to hear that gospel, and I pray that you will. I pray that you'll open doors and allow them to speak freely the good news of Jesus Christ to those communities where they live. Further, I pray for their finances, Lord, that you'll take care of them so they don't have to think and chase after the things of this world 
rather they can concentrate on ministry to which you've called them. I also want to pray for our local community right here in Muskegon. I want to pray for our leaders to have wisdom on how to run our county and our city. I want to pray for all of our emergency workers, police and fire and ambulance drivers and hospital staff. All of them need your blessing, Lord, so they can use their skills to allow us to live in peace and safety. Finally, Lord, I pray that our eyes will be opened and that our spirits sensitive to the word of God, which will be preached today. I ask that our minds will be sharp and able to understand the parables that Jesus taught. Help us, Lord, to apply these truths to our lives and even give us opportunity to share them with others. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just to set the stage for our next series of uh, songs, I'm going to read Job chapter 38, 1 to 18. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who dark, darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy, or who shut in the sea with doors uh, when it burst forth and issued uh, from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and the thick darkness its swaddling band, when I fixed my limit for it and set bars and doors, when I said, this, this far you may come, but no further, and here your proud ways must stop, have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It takes on form like clay under a seal and it stands out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld and the upraised arm is broken. Have you entered the springs of the seas? Or have you walked in search of its depths? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the doors of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the breadth of the earth? Tell me if you know all these things. Stay with me, please. We're going to try a new song. There is some music around if you read music. Um, it's out of a different hymnal, but we're going to sing through it and, and see how we do it.
Well, good morning again, everyone. I invite you to take your Bibles and join me in Matthew chapter 13 as we continue this morning enjoying together the kingdom parables, collection of eight parables in the book of Matthew chapter 13, describing and explaining to us the nature and the character and the content and the purposes of the kingdom of God between the first appearance of Messiah to die on our behalf and the second appearance of Messiah to rule and to reign. And today we're going to turn our attention to the parable of the wheat and the tares, having finished the seed and the sower last week. And just by way of quick reminder, I just want to define what a parable is. I don't want to assume that we all know what their purpose and their function is. But it's really best to think of it as a point of comparison. So what is going on here is that Christ is taking something with which we are very familiar, or maybe it's more appropriate to say the culture of the first century A.D. would have been very familiar with. 
So he's taking something that they were very, very familiar with, very concrete in their mind, and comparing it to something that's abstract about the character or the nature of God. And in so doing, he illustrates and teaches us the abstract. So you take the known, you compare it to the unknown, and it allows us to understand it. And I also want to remind you that it's important to, rem- to know why Jesus was teaching parables at this time. Look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 10. After he had finished the parables, some of these parables, the, the first question that the disciples had for him was this. And the disciples came and said to him, said to Christ, why do you speak to them in parables? This did not make any sense to them. Not only were they struggling to understand what the parables meant, they could take one look at the body language of the crowds and the multitudes until they were completely clueless as to what Christ meant. Why so coy? Why so elusive? Why withhold the truth? If you're going to speak in parables, I'm sure the disciples are saying, well, why not just plainly say what you mean? Jesus answered that question for them in in verse 11. And this is a very, very challenging answer to us because this really offends our sense of evangelistic values, doesn't it? And he, that's Jesus, answered and said to them, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. Why did Jesus teach in parables? Here's the answer, like it or not. To reveal himself to some and to conceal himself from others. And you, of course, the question would become, what triggered these parables at this time? Because prior to Matthew 13, Jesus wasn't teaching in parables. He was speaking very plainly to them. He was speaking very directly to them. What goes, what, the events of Matthew chapter 12, the opposition to Christ, explains to you why they're getting parables now. And all throughout Matthew chapter 12, the opposition, and dare I say hatred of Christ, is just ratcheting up. First they pose a few clever questions. Then they try to entrap him. Then they start plotting to destroy him. And by the end, if you look in Matthew chapter 12, I'm going to read verse 22 through 24. The opposition got so bad that it became like this. Then there was brought to him, that's Jesus, a demon-possessed man who was blind and dumb, and he healed him so that the dumb man spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and began to say, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? In other words, the people are now starting to ask, is this the promised Messiah? That's not what the religious leaders were saying, verse 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this man casts out demons only by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Things have gotten so bad that they're now accusing Christ of being Satan. And at that moment, Jesus says, you have gotten light, you have gotten truth, you have trampled it, and now, from this point on, you get parables. And to his chosen disciples, they get the explanation of the parables. And so these kingdom parables in Matthew 13 give us real insight into not only what God is like, but they also give us insight into a very particular, peculiar time in the history of man. And that's what we sometimes refer to as the church age. Because if you read through the Old Testament, there's no clear declaration that Messiah is coming first to die and then coming a second time to reign and rule. Now, in hindsight, we can connect some of the dots. (laughs) But at the time of Christ, there was no clear understanding of a first appearance and a second appearance. And the kingdom parables talk about that gap in between. What is God going to be doing? How will he be doing it? What will it be like to live in that gap? Because I will tell you, they had no expectation that Messiah would appear and die. Oh no, here's what they thought Messiah would do. I'm going to read to you Zephaniah 3, beginning at verse 15. 
It, it, it has this declaration of a glorious, victorious Messiah. The Lord has taken away his judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. In that day it will be said to Jerusalem, Do not be afraid, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will exalt over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. I will gather those who grieve about the appointed feast. They come, they came from you, O Zion. The reproach of exile is a burden on them. Behold, I am going to deal at that time with all your oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcasts, and I will turn their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in, even at the time when I gather you together. Indeed, I will give you renown and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. This is the king they wanted. They wanted a king that was going to pick up a sword and defeat and vanquish their enemy, which at the time was the Roman Empire. They didn't want to hear about a king that was going up a hill to die. They didn't want a king who was getting down and washing their feet. They did not want a king who would be spit upon and beaten. And of all things, nailed to a tree. A dead Messiah was of no use to them, or so they thought. They wanted a king, a conquering hero. And they had no sense that he was going to die for them. They had no sense that that's the king they needed. <laughs> More than anything else, they needed a king who was going to die for them. And so they have no idea what this life is going to be like between his first appearance and his second coming. And the kingdom parables, the kingdom parables help us see that. So last week, we saw the seed and the sower, and we learned that during this period of the church age, most who hear the gospel will not believe. That's a real pick-me-up parable, isn't it? <laughs> Did that this fire you up to just go out and, and go to work? Yeah, most are not going to believe. Now, we don't take it literally that it's going to be a 75-25 split. Remember, there were four soils, and three of them produced nothing of value, and one produced value for the king and for God. It doesn't mean literally that 75% are going to not believe and 25% will. It just means that most who hear will not believe. Now we move to the second of the kingdom parables, and I'm going to read this to you in Matthew chapter 13, beginning at verse 24 through 30. Listen May God grant you ears to hear as we study together the parable of the wheat and tares. Verse 24, he presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares also among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprang up and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. And the slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. And the slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No. Lest while you are gathering up the tares, you may root up the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up. But gather the wheat into my barn. Well, this, is, this particular parable is only recorded in the book of Matthew. You may recall last week the seed and the sower shows up in Mark and in Luke. The wheat and the tares is only in Matthew. And it actually describes a scene that would have been fairly, fairly common and known to the people living in first century A.D. Believe it or not, in that time period, there was something known as agricultural sabotage. Roman law actually prohibited it. 
And it was the act by which an enemy would come to your fields at night and would sow some of this, what was probably a, a, a weed known as darnel. They would sow this seed, and it was punishable under Roman law if you did this as an act of revenge or retaliation or in some way to hurt a competing farmer. So agricultural sabotage is actually a scene the people of Jesus' day would have recognized. They said, yep, we know what this is. This is bad, and this is against Roman law. And if you get caught doing this, you get punished severely. And the reason they would sow Darnell, and the reason that was so diabolical and so insidious, is because when it first springs up, it looks like wheat. And it's not until it begins to mature that you can begin to tell that it's not wheat. Its leaves tend to be a little thinner. Uh, The head is a little bit smaller. And it is particularly catastrophically damaging because it is poisonous to human beings. So you can imagine the effect this would have on a farmer's ability to make a living. If an enemy who may be competing with you were to go into your field and sow this, they might render your entire crop useless because you would have no way to easily separate the two. And if you were going to try to separate the two, that's a painstaking, labor-intensive action to separate the darnel from the, 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 the poisonous darnel from the edible wheat. And you can imagine why the Romans would be particularly upset about this. Because can can you imagine what a few zealots might do if they knew a farmer was selling a lot of wheat to the Romans? You know what they would do? They'd sneak in in the middle of the night and do what? Sow a lot of Darnell seed all over the place, hope the farmer never catches it, and you could poison a lot of Roman soldiers that way. So this was not an uncommon theme. People who heard this would have said, oh, yeah, I know what that is. I recognize that, even though to us it is very, very strange. Not, Not something common to our day. The other thing that's pretty unique about this parable when compared to other parables, there's an awful lot of dialogue in this parable. (laughs) The landowner spends a lot of time talking to his workers. And there's an exchange that is really the key to this parable as we're going to see. And so... It starts, look at verse 24. Let's just kind of unpack the parable very quickly because I know you, if you're like me, you want to jump to Jesus' explanation <laughs> because uh, this uh, probably at first glance, uh, you're ca- probably scratching your head wondering what has this got to do with anything? Uh, he says the kingdom of heaven may be compared. And it's not just to a man. I don't want you to miss this. Jesus is not comparing the kingdom of heaven to a man. He's comparing it to this situation, that this kingdom of heaven is going to be like a man who sows good seed in his soil. And like all the parables, this doesn't contain any elements of fantasy. There are no talking animals like in Aesop's fables. There's no mythology. There's no fantasy. Just everyday things are happening. It's just a straightforward story. And then we see the agricultural sabotage. But while men were sleeping, in other words, while the workers were sleeping, his enemy came. And so tares also among the wheat and went away. And as we can see, it has unfortunately the intended effect of the enemy. And the slave owner, verse 27, and the slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, Did you not sow good seed in your field? They obviously knew it was good seed. How then does it have tares? Listen, they would have known instantly that this was intentional. Any farmer would expect a few weeds. Any farmer would expect maybe a tear to pop up here or there. But because of the widespread explosion of the tares in this particular field, there's absolutely no doubt that this was intentional done by an enemy. Verse 28, and he said to them, an enemy has done this. Well, the slaves want to take action. Look at verse 28. And the slaves said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them away? In other words, the way this is written, 
as a, it's not really, a, it's kind of a rhetorical question, but they're in, you know what they think the slave owner's going to, the owner's going to say? Yes, go get the tares out of my field. They're ready to do something about it. They want to take action. And this is the part of the parable in verse 29 where things get very, very strange. But he, that's the landowner, said, no. What? What do you mean, no? Somebody's got tares in your field. We have to go get them. He says, no. Lest while you are gathering up the tares, you may root up the wheat with them. His command in verse 30. He says, when, it's, when, when the harvest comes, we'll bring in some extra workers Allow both to grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, a uh, slightly different title than the uh, slaves, so probably this is just people you would bring in at harvest time to help with the extra work. First, gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them away, burn them up, which would have been a very acceptable way to dispose of this. That's exactly what they would have done. They would have brought the tares, bundled them up, burned them so that no one could eat them but gather the wheat into my barn. So there's the parable. Straightforward, not particularly complicated. A little unusual that the landowner doesn't want to do anything about it. But nevertheless, no particularly difficult part to follow. Now go down to verse 34 and 35 where once again the Bible has this declaration about why Jesus is speaking in parables. Verse 34, all these things Jesus spoke to the multitudes in parables, and he did not speak to them without a parable. See the shift in the way he does things? Up and before this, he's been speaking to them very directly. Go read the, go read the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Very direct, straightforward. He says right now they're only getting parables. Verse 35, so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will other things hidden since the foundations of the world. This is a prophetic fulfillment of what the Messiah is going to do. Go to Psalm 78. Save your place there in Matthew 13. We're coming back. Let's go to Psalm 78. A psalm of Asaph which talks about this speaking in parables. Listen to this statement. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2 and 3. Listen, O my people, to my instruction. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. Look at that phrase in verse 2, dark sayings. Uh, Not dark in the sense that it's evil. Dark in the sense that it's unknown. The prophecy of Isaiah, the prophecy here of Asaph, is that the Messiah is going to reveal things that were previously unknown, and that he and he alone is qualified to teach. This idea of dark sayings is not an evil saying. If you're familiar, if you're a fan of C.S. Lewis, this is very similar to that idea of the deep magic. Remember C.S. Lewis and the cry talked about the deep magic. These ideas, these things that weren't known before, but Messiah will make known. And so it's it's going to be a, a mark of the Messiah that when the Messiah comes, he will speak of things that no one else has ever spoken of before. And he will teach things that have never been taught before. And quite frankly, he and he alone is qualified to teach. He would have to appear to teach these things. That's the whole point of what he's saying in Matthew 13, 11, when he says, it's been granted to you, my followers, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. That idea of the dark sayings, the mysteries, previously unknown things. And Jesus is anointed to tell them, 
But here's the beauty. It's obviously not God's intention to keep them hidden. He says, I'm going to reveal them, but I'm going to reveal them through my chosen one, through my anointed one, through parables. And so we are going to need a little help understanding them. We're going to need a little help because the parables are elusive, they are challenging, they are unsettling. They're calling for some response, but it's not always clear what that response should be. And so we need instruction. And so go back to Matthew 13, and I want you to see what the, what the disciples do. They ask for an explanation of the parable of the tares and the wheat. Look at verse 36. Matthew 13. Then he, that's Jesus, left the multitudes and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. Isn't that interesting what they called it? This tells you what they want to know about. Why won't this landowner go get the tares? It's funny that that's what they called it. Can you explain to us the parable of the tares? What kind of landowner lets these weeds grow unchecked? What kind of king lets opposition go unhindered? They want a fist to come crushing down on the opposition. You want to know where their heart is? (laughs) Let me just read. If you want to know where the disciples' evangelistic spirit was, let me read to you Luke chapter 9, verse 54, after Jesus had been insulted by the Samaritans. Luke chapter 9, verse 54, Jesus had just gone through Samaria, and the Samaritans had, had, uh, had not received him, and they wouldn't listen to him, and they ran him out of there. And the disciples were so upset about it that John and James come to Jesus. And they say this, and when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord... Do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? That's the evangelistic spirit we all need, right? (laughs) I know what we need to do, Lord. We need to get all the sinners in a room and burn them up. Listen, this is why the tares makes no sense to them. What kind of king lets opposition go unchallenged? Why in the world, Lord, Would you allow these to grow up? Well, Jesus is happy to explain it to them and praise God from whom all blessings flow that he explained it. (laughs) Because we need the help, (laughs) quite frankly. (laughs) And and in this parable is a little bit more allegorical than most. So Jesus is going to do two things here. Beginning in verse 37, he tells you some of the symbolism in the parable, what some of these things stand for, and then he kind of gives you the explanation of what the parable is really all about with the gathering of the wheat and tares together at the end of the age. It's not purely allegorical. There's no symbolic meaning given to the sleeping. There's no symbolic meaning given to the slaves, to the barn. Uh, There's no explicit explanation of what the fire is all about, Um, but there certainly are some equivalencies here where Jesus says this stands for this. So the multitudes don't get the explanation, only the disciples. So let's just jump right in. Verse 37, and he, Jesus, answered and said, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. So first thing we learn is that this owner who's gone out and sowed the good seed is the son of man. By the way, that is Jesus' favorite title for himself. He uses that title for himself more than any other title. And there are probably two reasons that he does that. Number one is to identify with humanity. He is our sympathetic high priest. He knows what it feels like to be hungry. He knows what it feels like to be exhausted. He knows what it feels like to cry and to be hurt and to be betrayed. When we go to Christ, we go to a a God who knows what it's like to be in our shoes. He's walked that mile. 
He's been tempted by Satan, yet never failed. So the first reason he probably uses the Son of Man title is because it identifies him with us. Also, the sons and daughters of humanity. But there's another reason why he uses it. Do you know who's the first prophet? little trivia question. You know who's the prophet who gives us the title Son of Man? Does anybody know? Yeah, it's Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. We'll go there. Let me read verses 13 and 14 to you. Daniel's prophecy in chapter 7 as he is talking about the culmination of human history. He's talking about this idea of the end of the age, which we'll talk about more in a moment. Listen to what he says. Verse 13, I kept looking into the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man. In other words, he's saying somebody who looked like a human. Someone who looks like a human. One like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the ancient of days. Of course, that would be a reference to God the Father, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. I tell you this, when he tells those disciples that the sower of the seed is the Son of Man, he is drawing their attention to this image of the end of history, the culmination of history. But he doesn't stop there. Look at verse 38, Matthew chapter 13. And the field is the world. It's the word word cosmos. It usually means the universe. It also can mean all of mankind. In other words, this is not a parable. Let's be clear about this, folks. Let's get this, beloved. This is not a parable about unbelievers growing up in the church. Now, we get plenty of warnings about that. Plenty of warnings about that. The parable of the good wedding guest. Remember the wedding where somebody snuck in without the proper clothing and they went and took a seat in the front row of the wedding and in the parable Jesus was teaching, they had to go and remove him because he didn't come with the right wedding clothes. We're told to be warned of false prophets who will look like sheep but they're actually wolves. There's, listen, there's no end to the false teachers who are happy to teach to us a God that we want versus the God that we need. They teach a God who will make us healthy and wealthy and give us all of our dreams rather than a God who is beaten and stricken and killed for us. This is not a parable about the world in the church. This is a parable about the church in the world. He says, the field is the cosmos. The field where this good seed is sown and the field where the bad seed is sown is the world. It's not the church. And then he goes on, verse 38, and as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. So the good seed are believers. The good seed are those who are following Christ. Those who belong to the kingdom of heaven. Then he goes on. He says, these are the sons of the kingdom. Then he ends the verse 38 by saying, and the tares are the sons of the evil one. So right off we see this world in which there are the children of God and there are the children of Satan. And it's very, very personal, isn't it? It's very personal because look at verse 39. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. There are plenty of times in the Bible where Jesus says, you are like your father, the father of lies, the father of murder. Let's be clear about this. Everyone who is ever going to go to heaven is going there for the same reason. And everyone who is ever going to go to hell is going there for the same reason. They're in heaven because of their personal relationship with the Son of Man. 
In the Old Testament, they were there because they trusted and believed that the Son of Man was coming. Those of us in the church age are going to be there because we know the Son of Man has come. And everyone who is in hell is there for the same reason, because they have rejected the Son of Man. And it's very, very personal. In this world that we're seeing in this parable, there are two kinds of people, the sons of the kingdom and the sons of Satan. And it's this personal confrontation. You know, we saw this in the seed and the sower, didn't we? Remember the first soil? Well, it actually wasn't soil at all. The seeds went on the path, and who came and took them away? Satan. You see this opposition to the kingdom. There is this opposition to the kingdom of God, this opposition to the kingdom of heaven, and it's very personal. So we see that he, the spoiler, the one who builds nothing, the one who constructs nothing, the one who only despoils everything. Satan is the one who has sown the seed of the tares. Well, he goes on to describe what's going to happen to these tares. Verse 39, let me finish that up. And the harvest is the end of the age. The end of the age. You know, that is a Jewish figure of speech. It was an, there was an understanding that the current age would transition to the next age through a great judgment. And so the end of the age is a little bit like we talked about with the graduation here. It's a, it's a, it's a transition. It's a commencement. It's the end of one period of time and in entering into the next period of time. And so the Jewish expression marked the close of the current age a, a massive judgment, a cataclysmic judgment, and then entering into the next age. When Jesus talked about the temple being destroyed, he told the disciples, he said, this temple you see here, Herod's temple at that time, standing where Solomon's temple used to be, he said, this is all going to be torn down. Not one brick will stand upon the other. You know what the disciples asked? They said, will that be the sign of the end of the age? Because they just, they just anticipated that it would be some massive judgment. He says, no, this, this end of the age is the harvest. You know, you've got to be careful with words like harvest. I know a lot of churches will put that name on their church, but quite frankly, more times than not in the Bible, harvest is a really bad thing. <laughs> it's kind of like leaven. Sometimes in the Bible, leaven's a really good thing, and sometimes leaven's a really bad thing. And so you've got to read the context to know most of the time, harvest in the Bible is a really bad thing. It's a time of cataclysmic judgment. Now, I know we as Christians talk about the harvest. We're thinking about people going out and sharing the gospel and bringing in believers and people being saved, and we kind of think of the harvest in that way. Uh, this is not a happy scene. It's a happy scene for the wheat. It's a very unhappy scene for the tares. So look what Jesus says. He says this. He says at the end of the age, he's going to send reapers. And the reapers are angels. Therefore, verse 40, just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. In that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, he who has ears, let him hear. So you say, what is this all about? Listen, as badly as you and I would love to see God, just, His justice upon those who are wicked, you and I don't live in the age of the judgment. We're not living in the age of the judgment. That's to come. We live in the age of the proclamation. We live in the age of declaration. Inquisitions and punishments are not our tool as a church. What did Jesus say? He said, I did not come to condemn the world. I came to do what? Save the world. And we live in that age. And it's hard, isn't it? Listen, I'm like you. I've been watching the news, although I haven't been watching it for about two weeks, quite frankly. I've been on a fast. Had all I could take. Because it angers us, doesn't it? 
It angers us to see rioters going unchecked. And we so desperately want to see justice. And we know that God loves justice, and He's a God of justice, and He is going to judge. But He wants His followers to understand that final judgment of the tares and the wheat is coming. Until then, they're going to grow up together. You and I are not in the age of the judgment. We are in the age of of declaration, proclaiming that which is true, calling the elect to Christ. So our faith is in the message. Our faith is in the truth that Christ saves. And so it's hard, this, this idea of the delayed judgment, it's hard. But I will tell you this, beloved, you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, should be very, very thankful for the delayed judgment. Because if he had not delayed the judgment, where would you and I be? What would have happened to us? Because quite frankly, God would have been quite justified in judging and condemning me before I came to Christ. He didn't need to be patient. He didn't need to wait. I had no plea. I had no defense. That's why we are always warned as Christians to remember what we once were when we see someone who's still lost in their sin. Paul warned a young pastor, Titus. He said this in in Titus chapter 3, verse 2, For we also once were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. Not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy. Listen, we're thankful, aren't we, that He was patient. And it is an act of His kindness and patience to endure to bestow His love upon others. And while He chooses to do that, we are to be patient and to persevere. And so we don't lose hope when the Word of God chokes off some scorched, the sun comes and persecutes others and they fall away or it falls on the path and the birds take it away. We don't become discouraged. And we don't doubt God's justice when it's delayed. This idea of this delayed reaction, this delayed separation of the wheat and the tares. We know the cataclysmic end is coming. And until God appoints that hour, the church of Jesus Christ perseveres with a mission of declaration and proclamation until the age of judgment comes. Obviously, God is not in a hurry, is He? He has His own time frame. He has His own kindness. He has His own patience. And it's calling for us to wait for the final culmination of history. And we wait according to His good will. Now, i got to say, these first two parables, they're not exactly pick-me-uppers, are they? (laughs) You're going to preach the gospel and most people aren't going to hear it. (laughs) And oh, by the way, unbelievers and wicked people are going to grow up right along beside you in the world. (laughs) And it's going to look like they're getting away with everything. Well, that's fantastic, Lord. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, The good news is in the next two parables, the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven, uh, we're going to see next week that the church has a lot of influence. And God is advancing His will and His kingdom through the tiny little seed of the mustard seed that grows into a mighty tree, and just a little bit of leaven leavens the whole loaf. And so we're going to see next week uh, that the kingdom is having an impact. and It is having an effect, and so we should be encouraged. Well, let's pray together and ask God to grant us that patience while we wait for Him to act. 
Well, Lord, we are so thankful for your patience this morning. We have become the objects of your love and the objects of your kindness because you have shown us patience. While we were yet sinners, you showed us patience, drawing us to yourself, sealing us with your Holy Spirit, sanctifying us and growing us with each day in deeper love and commitment to you. So when we see unbelievers, when we see the wicked, when it appears that they are prospering and justice is nowhere to be found, we will continue to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Knowing that your word does not return void and empty, but it accomplishes every good deed for which you intended it. And so, Lord, we're here today to declare whatever your timetable is, uh, we are content to follow it. We know that your timings are perfect, your seasons are ordained by you. And as long as there is time, as long as you tarry, we will preach so that you may call all men unto yourself. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? We do have an order of service. I'm calling an audible. You guys did such a good job on Behold Our God. We're going to sing the chorus of that. We're going to go right into the doxology a cappella from there. Give her a try. on his throne, come let us adore him, behold our King, nothing can compare, come let us adore him, praise God from whom all blessings flow, praise him all creatures here below. Finally, brethren, be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.